Hey, pals, we just want to say thank you to all our fans that support us out there. If you want to become a supporter and you like to support us through the value for value proposition, we provide value and we would love to see you give us some value back. You can see all the ways that you can do that at Patreon. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash go with the heat. Now let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season five, episode four, titled Bad Timing. Yeah. <laughs> Bad song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's the timing. <laughs> I think the Bad name- timing for this episode. <laughs> we, we were going so strong, too. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like, were, this is just bad timing all around. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered- This episode accomplished nothing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I have, I have an opinion about that. Well, I'm going to say for, for, for my final thoughts, but I think the bad story is an exchange of a theme that they're trying to deliver. But we're going to come back to that. This episode, okay. this episode originally premiered on December 2nd, 1988. It is written by Scott Shepard, who also helped write Redemption and Blood and Freefall. He's like a teleplay writer on both of those. He's got two more episodes coming that he wrote himself, all by his big oh, boy self. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is directed by Virgil Vogel. That name should sound familiar. He's directed a number of episodes, including Cuba Libre, Teresa, Hell Hath No Fury, and then this is his last one. Well, there you go. <laughs> Close the book on you. <laughs> you know, and I'll talk more about this in guest stars, but I think they were having some kind of vice reunion while they were filming this episode. <laughs> um, because there's a lot of returning people in this. Virtual Vogel went out with a bang. All my friends are in this one. <laughs> Served ice cream cake. All right, John, there's a couple big name bands in this. One of them we've heard from before, but one I'm surprised worked its way into this episode. What do you got for us this week? Let's just get the obvious out of the way. We have Power and Freedom and Cold Metal by Iggy Pop. You may also remember him from appearing in my music for the episodes Kill Shot and the episode Blood and Roses. So this is his third appearance. So being his third appearance, we're not going to spend too much time. I'm just going to give you Iggy Pop. His band was the Stooges. His best friend forever was David Bowie. Uh, They even went to rehab together. You know, he's that old punk guy. Not the one with the bleached hair and the earring, but the one that looks like a retired skateboarder or some (laughs) old surfer. That old surfer guy that tried to sell you pot once on the beach. Like that guy. That Iggy Pop. Let's move on to the original music of the episode with Don't Talk Dirty to me by Jermaine Stewart. He was the one performing at the prison. That really was Jermaine Stewart. Best known for the 1986 hit, We Don't Have to Take Our Clothes Off. He sure doesn't want to do a whole lot of stuff, I'll tell you that. (laughs) We don't have to do any of that. (laughs) We Don't Have to Take Our Clothes Off reached number two in the UK and Canada and number five in the US. But his career started well before that, where he began his career as a dancer on Soul Train in the (laughs) mid-1970s. Him and three of his friends, uh, other dancers on Soul Train, would eventually move to L.A. and audition for pop group Shalimar, which was being put together by Soul Train creator Don Cornelius, a few uh, uh, business associates. He'd lose out on the lead vocalist spot, and so he would end up touring as a dancer with the group for several years. But while in London for a show, he would meet Culture Club's Mikey Craig, and Mikey Craig would help him put together a demo and even get him a job singing backup vocals on culture club song miss me blind would attract enough attention to get him a record contract his first album saw some success but his second album 1986's frantic romantic was really the breakout album and that was the one that featured we don't have to take our clothes off and don't talk Dirty to Me. It peaked at number 34 in the U.S. Third album was also successful, and then his fourth and final would do well in the U.K., but make little impact in the U.S. So by 1991, he had teamed up with producer Jesse Saunders for what would be his last recorded work, uh, or last known recorded work. It would be released as a single and would sell poorly, and the actual album is still remains to this day unreleased. 
<laughs> Whoops. Uh huh. Shortly before his death, he began recording an album called Believe Me, and some of the tracks were released in 2005 on a compilation album. But before he could finish recording the album, Stewart died of AIDS related liver cancer on March 17, 1997. Wow. He was 39 years old. Wow. That brings us to Hank Williams. The tragedy would in this story as well. We have the song I'm So Lonely I Could Cry. Hank Williams is the, an iconic country singer and songwriter and is well regarded as one of the most significant influences of 20th century music. He recorded 35 top 10 singles, five of which became top 10 posthumously, including 11 ones. His actual name? Hiram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, but for a while it was spelled, it was misspelled as a uh, Hyrium. Hi so, and as a kid, he was called, often called by the nickname Herky, Harm, or Poops. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. So his dad was a World War One vet. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I didn't go into a ton of detail about his childhood, but he moved around a bunch. He had, he had kind of a rough childhood. He, he was diagnosed with spina bifida. His dad had health problems and was in the hospital for years at a time. His mom worked like five jobs during the Depression. But what spun out of all that was while he was living in Georgiana, he would meet Rufus T. Tot Payne, a street performer, and Payne would give Williams guitar lessons in exchange for meals prepared by Williams' mom, Lily, and he basically taught him to blues. So in 1937, the Williams and McNeil family opened up a boarding house on South Perry Street in downtown Montgomery, Alabama. This is when Hiram would change his name to Hank. He would also win a talent show for a whole $15. <laughs> wow. You could get a good size wagon for that much. <laughs> he would spend his days performing on the street in front of WSFA radio station. And the radio station would actually occasionally invite him to perform on air. To the point where they started getting so many listeners asking for the singing kid that the station gave him his own 15-minute show twice a week for a salary of, guess what, guys? 15 whole dollars a week. <laughs> He would follow that into the start of a music career. He would start a band called the Drifting Cowboys. His mom, Lily, at the time, would be their manager. He would drop out of school and he would begin touring. In between tours, he would do his radio show. But this is also when alcohol issues started to show up, as he would commonly spend the show's revenue on booze at the show. He didn't even leave. <laughs> no, really wasn't making a lot of money, you know, the touring part, but he still had his radio show. World War II would break out, and he would re receive a deferment. So, and this is where I have some issue with his, with the Wikipedia page, because it says he receives his deferment, for a back injury falling from a bowl during a rodeo. Okay. Or maybe it could be because he had spina bifida. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a, no. a, whole, a whole lot of rodeo stuff happening in that biography. But suddenly he can't go to war now because of the rodeo. Yeah, yeah. But we did make spina bifida back in his childhood that would cause him excruciating back pain to life. But no, no, it was the bowl. He, when he fell off that bowl that one time. <laughs> his entire band would be drafted into service and he would be all alone and his alcoholism would worsen and the replacement band members would start to refuse to play with him. And by 1942, he would be fired from his radio job for habitual drunkenness. Wow. He'd spend the rest of the war working for a shipbuilding company and performing at bars and probably spending that revenue at those bars. Hey, Melissa, you sure Hank Williams Sr. isn't your grandfather? I think he might be. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds an awful lot of his track record. So, <laughs> so in 1943, he would meet Audrey Shepard. They would illegally marry at a Texaco station with hopes of starting a new band and getting his radio show back. How do you get illegally married? So there's a lot station. <laughs> yeah, I'm confused. Why was it there's illegal a, though? Because is she young or something? Is that what it was? <laughs> no, there, there's a little bit to unpack here. So it was illegal because she was still technically in the 60 day grace period after her divorce. And this would also be a common theme in William's life. Technically, their marriage would never be legal, even though they got married by a justice of a peace at a perfectly good Texaco station. <laughs> Basically, help him get his 
get his crap kind of together, and he would eventually get his radio pipe, and she actually would get him a small record deal by interrupting producer Fred Rose's weekly ping pong game. <laughs> She's a brave woman. Now that's going to bat for your man. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you get know. hurt interrupting someone's ping pong game. I'm sorry. I don't know if I would interrupt someone's ping pong game for your career. I don't know. <laughs> Post-war so, America was so extra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the recordings from that would, would garner attention from MGM Records. He would receive a record deal in 1947 and release Move It On Over, which would be a massive hit be thrust into his own national radio show plus tours and finally find a place in the Grand Old Opry, which he years before he auditioned for and was turned down. So he would start touring with the Grand Old Opry. His first show, he would do six encores, which is a record. Then by 1951, he was touring with Bob Hope and he had numerous hits. He did his first TV appearance on the Perry Como show. By the end of 51, things would start to fall apart again would be injured in a fall on a hunting trip with his fiddler, Jerry Rivers. <laughs> I mean, never trust never trust a fiddler. I don't know what he was thinking going hunting with his fiddler. <laughs> Once again, this would stir up his back issues, and he would begin abusing prescription drugs this time on top of alcohol. He would eventually go into treatment in December of 51, as well as move back with his mom during his treatment that would kind of be the end of his him and his fake wife shepherd <laughs> he would again record a ton but would eventually be fired again but this time by the grand old opry for guess what guys habitual drunkenness <laughs> surprise he'd move back to louisiana he would play shows and do local radio but and during this time of him being fired by the grand old opry one of the songs he wrote was about billy jean jones billy g jones was a girlfriend of his of one of his band members at the time who eventually became his girlfriend and then his kind of sort of wife because their marriage wouldn't count either because she was still technically married before and the divorce had <laughs> it, it's this whole thing i don't think they actually understand how marriage works and how it how a divorce works Shit so they would never. This is all sounding a bit very Tennessee up in here. <laughs> By 1952, he started to suffer heart problems due to his excess. This is when he would meet Horace Toby Marshall, who was an ex-convict and a basically a fake doctor. He was a <laughs> con man who convinced him that he was a doctor. He would prescribe amphetamines, morphine, and other painkillers. And for some reason, he had to help Sorry. him move bull semen around. <laughs> And, well, that would kind of lead us toward the end of William's life. He would be scheduled to perform at Municipal Auditorium in Charleston, West Virginia. But because of an ice storm, he would hire college student Charles Carr to drive him from Knoxville to the, the uh, event in West Virginia. Carr picked him up at a hotel room, and when he found him, he would request a doctor. He would give him an impaired poop, a shot of vitamin B12, and with a little bit of morphine in it, you know, because uh, <laughs> that, that, that should help. They would drive for while he would stop briefly at an all-night restaurant poop would turn down any food which would believe to be his last word they would drive a little bit longer and they would stop at a gas station only for car to find him dead and that rigor mortis had set in mm. between that diner uh -huh. and the gas station it sounds like car was like yeah thank god he finally fell asleep <laughs> i just couldn't handle this drunken ass in my back seat this whole time uh-huh I uh, just so happy he's been yeah. asleep for so, a few hours. Dr. Ivan Mellinum would perform the autopsy. He would find hemorrhages in Poot's heart and neck, which would ultimately be ruled heart failure, but as kind of a suspicious death because he would also note that Poot appeared to be severely beaten and recently kicked in the groin area. Very mm. hard. Wow. He would also record that he had a visible welt on his head in order an inqui inquiry, though there's no information about how that inquiry went. Wow. So, Poop died at 29 years old, and I actually Googled it. I Googled Hank Williams' murder, and there are a bunch of different theories out there, but I will tell you this, that there is a more... 
extensive breakdown of his last days. Who really knows for sure. But apparently this trip with him and Carr was more of a road trip. And I guess they stopped at radio stations along the way. And he was partying. And they had girls in the hotel room. So God knows what actually happened on this road trip before he just magically wound up dead at this gas station it could be something as simple as he did do rodeo and one of the stops was was a rodeo stop or it could be as complex as one night things got too rowdy and he got beaten really bad and you combine that with his bad heart and he bled he internally bled to death and when Carr realized that there was going to be this paper trail of all these crazy nights that they had together it's going to look like Carr murdered him he like, tried to stage it up so it looked like I was just escorting him across the country and he died in the back seat. Yeah, like how did he not know he was dead and rigor mortis had set in? <laughs> yeah. And I guess Dr. Ivan Malinum was thick Russian who barely spoke any English. So <laughs> there's all kinds of weird stuff about this. Died very early, 29 years old. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, gowiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know where you stand on this episode, Bad Timing. Because I mentioned we understand the context, but we also said it's pretty bad. Let us know what your thoughts are on this. And let us know what your thoughts are on how this ties in the whole Amnesia arc. Because this is technically the last episode. So how do you feel about this being the last one for the Amnesia arc? Email us, gowiththeheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support us. Support step number one, email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Contact us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can find all those places where you can contact us. We would love to hear from you. Support step number two, check out that Patreon. As I've mentioned in the past, we support the value for value model. If you find value in this show, we'd love for you to show how much value you find in this show. Go support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. And let us know how much value you find in this. For as little as a dollar a month, you get access to all kinds of new Patreon exclusives. Plus, you can show how much value we bring into your life. We bring you an hour plus every week of value. We'd love to see how much you, value you put on that. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. Bye.